Today, we start our misadventure off, unfortunately, with a betrayal. I trusted you, Kubernetes, when you told me that this was the Kubernetes scalability numbers, I took that on blind faith. So much so that when I started with the cloud provider that I worked for, and they were like, who are we gonna find dumb enough to take scalability issues all day? I looked that man in the eye and I told him, I'm that dumb. He looked at me, quickly agreed, and that became my full-time job. <laughs> but quickly there was a problem. I would go out to customers as small as 5,000 nodes and I was experiencing the slowness, sometimes even crashes. Meanwhile, on the other end of the spectrum, I go out to customers that had 6,000 nodes running just fine. Something was wrong. Now, I knew nodes wouldn't be the me best measure of scale because they come in all different sizes. And usually it's a mix, but that was okay because pods. Pods will tell me what's the best, but I would have 10,000 pods that wouldn't talk to the control plane and be long lived and now to have 10,000 pods that might only live for 15 minutes on a spark job, and then another, and another hour, another 10,000, and that's where I would get the crashes. Okay, so wait a minute. So nodes and pods don't correlate in any way to if something's gonna scale successfully. This is a disaster. Gang, ever since I was a little Shane, I had one dream. <laughs> that I was gonna grow up one day, and I was gonna get paid money to nerd flex on people. But now that dream is lying in tatters. We've gotta figure out how are we gonna to get to the bottom of Kubernetes scalability. And with the stage set in the most ridiculous way possible, we are gonna go all the way down the rabbit hole to understand the true nature of Kubernetes scalability. My late night crowd, are you ready to hit this really hard? Let me hear it. All right, it's the late night crowd right there, I love it. All right, gang, I had, let, we start our journey off with the clue. It's that spark job, I have 10,000 pods. I dumped them all on the scheduler, that's when I was getting the slowness. Same number of pods, same number, same exact cluster, I batched it out just a little bit over time, runs just fine. It's almost like the rate of change that I'm pushing to the control plane at any point in time seems to be somehow related to Kubernetes scalability. And that makes a lot of sense. If you look at the discrete components in Kubernetes, each one has its own unique mechanism that controls that rate of change. Set that value too high, we're gonna crash the Kube controller manager. We're gonna lock the etcd, leave it at its default value, however, and we underutilize the hardware and cause the scale problems that we're trying to prevent. I don't know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Shane, I'm gonna go fix that on the API server, and look, I'm more guilty of that than anyone. I've written a ton about troubleshooting the API priority and fairness system. If you're interested in that, you can go check that out here. But for today's adventure, if it's truly the rate of change that we're pushing through the control plane at any given point in time, would it make sense to take a look at the thing that's making those changes, the controllers? The thing that's taking that declarative YAML and changing the state of the world to match our declared intent. The minute that we do that, we would probably go to the kube controller manager, which all these controllers live in the control plane, and we immediately see the problem. That Spark job is completely saturated, that jobs controller, but every other controller on the system is running just fine. Would you say that Kubernetes is slow? No, not really, right? But now we have to shift our thinking. We'd have to think in terms of how much volume were we sending to any given controller in that fixed amount of time. To understand this better, we're gonna have to take a big step back and ask a basic question. What does a controller look like? <laughs> does it look like a, a queue? You knew exactly where I was going with that. That's right, it does look like a queue. Gang, we're looking at the work queue package inside of the job controller, but this could be inside of the Kube uh, controller manager or any controller, load balancer controller, et cetera. And what we're looking at here is in this work queue, we have these objects that the job controller is in charge of reconciling. 
So let's take a big step back. How did we get here? There is a pod that is associated with this job. It's created, it's deleted. It's gonna update that pod informer or that pod cache. That job controller is watching that pod cache. It knows it needs to reconcile something so it puts a new object in that queue. This reconciliation that that job controller is directly related to scale. If that's getting saturated, we need to change the speed of that reconciliation, and I'm gonna teach you how to do that right now. Gang, we're back at that work queue package. You know what that looks like. But we have two new fields, concurrency and QPS. What this concurrency field is all about is the go threads that are doing the actual reconciliation. So basically, by default, the jobs controller only has five of these threads. In a larger cluster, it wouldn't be unusual to have this as 100 threads. In a really big cluster, it wouldn't be crazy to put it at 500. And because of this, each of these controllers has a flow control mechanism that I know you're familiar with from Kubelet and Scheduler and everywhere else in the control plane, this query per second and burst rate, because we need to make sure that we don't overflow the API and etcd server. But what do you set these values at? Let's take a look at that. If I increase this queries per second, I have to be mindful that I do not exhaust this API priority and fairness queue or the flow and hand sizes that are in that API server. But more interestingly, this concurrency rate, if I was doing five writes to the etcd server and I switched that concurrency value to 100, I now would need to make sure that I have enough headroom in that etcd or I will cause a disaster. But how do we do that? Shane, I don't even have access to the etcd. Don't worry, I got you. So what we're gonna look at is this client agent inside of the API server that you do have access to. And what we're gonna look for is we're gonna make sure that our CRUD verbs are under one second and our cluster-wide list are under 30 seconds. Okay, we're gonna hit our first chart. And what we're looking for, this is etcd request duration seconds. And notice that it's a P99. When we use a P99, we're gonna use bucketed metrics. That's gonna be important later. Why we use a P99 for all control plane stuff, you don't want to take three API servers and average them together. You don't want to take three etcd servers and average them together. Now let's go look at these fields. We are under one second for all the CRUD verbs. We are under, well under one second for the cluster-wide list. Do I have enough headroom to start playing with these tunables in the Kubernetes control plane? Yes, we do. In fact, would I check these values if I was tuning anything in the control plane? Yes, I would. Ensuring that you have this headroom is critically important. But do you have this problem? Give me five minutes and I'll teach you how to detect this problem in the control plane. But first, some theory. Okay, I have a, a Kubernetes client that decides I'm gonna do a thousand jobs all at the same time but that QPS burst rate is causing a bottleneck. Those objects are gonna stack in the queue. Luckily, we have a metrics to see if this condition is happening. And this is called work queue depth. Do you see that spike with the 10,000 right there? You putting up those kind of numbers? You got my attention. But with uh, Kubernetes control plane numbers are bursty by nature. If in one metric period it's busy and the next minute it's not, I'm not so worried about that. The etcd might defrag or something like that. However, if I see these spikes happening a bunch of times in just a few hours, I do have a problem and let's go investigate that together. What am I looking for? Ladies and gentlemen, if you remember nothing else, latency is the enemy of scale. So we're going to measure the latency from the time that that object goes in the KCM to the time that it's processed. Low, low latency equals scale. We're gonna check this out with this new metric, work queue, or sorry, queue duration. How long did it sit in that queue? And what do we see at that top bucket? Multiple periods, right? It's timed out. We need to go take a look at that. Let's do that now. Now this can happen for another reason, a, a number of reasons, but let me talk about one of the more complex ones. There might just be some slowness and getting that one reconcile done. Maybe it's got a lot of stuff to reconcile. Maybe it's got errors. We'll talk about some of the reasons why this happens. But what I want you to focus on with me for a second is the impact that this is going to have. 
that go thread gets locked up for a period of time, I only have four left. I've just reduced the scale and performance of that controller by what, like 20%? That's a big deal. Plus, I'm holding open the seats on the API server, and this is also having an impact on the etcd. How am I going to see if this is happening? This is the last metric on KCM that I have for you. Work duration seconds. How long did that unit of work take to reconcile? When I see this at the top, for hours on end, do I have a problem? You bet I do. Does this mean that these requests are timing out? No, because we've been betrayed yet again. This time, by a metrics bucket? How on earth do you even get betrayed by a bucket? Let me tell you. All right, so bucketed metrics are really expensive. So typically we only do 10 of those at a given time. For whatever reason though, they started those buckets at 10 seconds and exponentially went down to the nanosecond level, which is great if you're troubleshooting quantum uncertainty, but for what we need, it's practically useless because we need to go into the other direction. Okay, how are we gonna get around this? We're gonna use an average, right? But wait a minute, Shane, didn't you just tell me not to use an average? Yeah, but I told you this was a story of betrayal, right? So we get, rid <laughs> we get rid of those buckets. And what do we find? That wasn't 10 seconds, that was four minutes. Was this wrong in Kubernetes the whole time? Yes, me and my buddy Jens are trying to get this fixed right now. But the point I wanna make is this, we use metrics to find what we wanna look at and the time frame, and then we move to the logs. And I'll cover this in a little bit more detail in a second. Okay, gang, I, what I'm gonna show you is the output from a bunch of queries. Don't worry, I'm going to provide you with 25 different queries, all with explanations that we use globally around the world every day to identify these uh, you know, drunk dialing style uh, workloads. I'm also gonna provide you with uh, um, a guide that basically goes through everything that I wrote uh, that covers a little bit more than I have time for today. But back to our story. What I'm gonna do is that duration in seconds on the end, that thing that's taking the longest, I'm gonna sort by that duration a second. I'm gonna look for the agent, that villain in my story that's causing that slowness on that controller. And once I find that, I'll have the URI to see what it's doing. What's it doing? It's requesting all 50,000 pods unpaginated at the same time. That's my villain, but we're not gonna stop there. Because it, once we find the agent, we're going to go into the individual request. And let me tell you why. There are some really awesome annotations that will tell you where the latency is at. If we look up here at the top, and it's been expanded in 131, but let me give you a brief tour. It will give you the etcd. If etcd is slow, don't troubleshoot anything else. That's the villain. This slow response right, what that is is if the client is slow to respond back to the API server. What's some common reasons for this? Um, really aggressive CPU limits. That workload uh, node is out of bandwidth, things of that nature. But the villain in our story today is the serialization time? What even is that? That JSON of 50,000 pods serializing to go over the network, 34 seconds. That's over half of the API server. Would I have found that in a million years had I not went to this level in the logs? I don't know about a million years, but I spent three weeks. My mentors came in and they spent 20 minutes figuring out if you want to be on the pro level, gang. These guys, they spend 80 to 90% of their time in the logs for everything they troubleshoot, and I recommend you do the same. Now, to give credit where credit's due, um, the most of the research that I'm gonna share with you today probably comes from one of these four gentlemen. I believe one or two of them are here today, and so they don't beat me up in the parking lot for stealing the research. I wanna give credit where credit's due. But now that we've got my safety out of the way, I wanna take everything and put this together for you. Gang, if I am under one second of latency to the API and etcd server, the number of objects that those controllers can reconcile will be a big number, let's call that a thousand. However, if that number, if that latency is elevated, the number of objects that that controller can reconcile will go down and go down dramatically. So for every rung, I go up on this latency ladder, that number of objects that I can reconcile drops dramatically. What does this mean in practice? 
right when you need that performance the most, that latency spikes and the performance and scalability that you had just moment bef moments before now just slip through our fingers. Gang, if you've ever had where you put some kind of workload on and the thing just struggles to reconcile, this could be the villain in your story. But what makes this latency go so high? A few different reasons, but one of the biggest is these clients that are talking to the control plane. Sometimes some things are just going crazy on the control plane. Other times it's something legitimate, a GitOps system. It needs to know the status of all 50,000 pods. Your metric system, it can't cache that information. The metrics have to be new each time. If that stuff starts coming in too fast, here's what happens. Bam, I make a request. I've got to send all 50,000 pods back. It takes a long time to serialize. I have to hold that response in memory. The next thing comes in. All of a sudden you see where this is going. My memory starts to exhaust. My networking starts to exhaust. My etcd latency time due to some complicated b tree read stuff also elevates and this is the villains in the story gang if you look at this list of villains you'll notice much of the things that we talked about happen client side and we talked about these it if it's serialization delay maybe it's a bad webhook just something drunk dialing the api server if you have these going on in your network does it make sense to touch any of these tunables in the control plane? Most adamantly, I would tell you no. Gang, but I'm only telling you half the story. For the other half of the story, we'll have to find someone that pushes their workloads and clusters in that same loving and gentle Marine Corps fashion that I do. <laughs> and if we wanna find out what, Kubernetes major malfunction is, we're gonna have to talk to my buddy, Tima. Complicated, boring stuff, right? Like, listen, I got a simple fix for all your cluster scalability problems. You run a custom coop scheduler, you set the strategy to most delegated, and your cluster is gonna be reduced <laughs> in half. That's it, we're done. Okay, jokes aside, we had a plan to optimize the workload that involved the custom coop scheduler, but first, let me introduce you to the workload itself that sparked Shane's interest. The workload consists of Spark jobs that run in the cluster mode, which is a bunch of driver pods fanning out the work to executors, and the driver pods are created by Kubernetes jobs. We were creating about two thousands of them a second in the largest cluster, and as you can imagine, the control plane was not really happy about it. Uh, we were setting new records for the queue depths, but at first glance, you would think that like we were doing this to ourselves, right? S creating so many jobs so quickly, like what did we expect? But it turns out that it's totally possible to scale Kubernetes for workloads like ours. We just had to really look at how workload uses Kubernetes, what's going on in the data plane, and along the way, resolve a number of scalability bottlenecks. The first one of which was seemingly related to the container storage interface. In the early iteration of this workload, we had a persistent volume mounted to some of the executor pods, which was used by Spark for scratch space. And over time, we noticed that a number of pending pods were building up in the cluster and they were waiting for these volumes. So we were really curious why, and the answer is always in the logs, so the container storage interface driver was timing out, waiting for some external attacher. What is that? It turns out that's a storage system that is external to the cluster that was used for these persistent volumes. And it simply couldn't keep up with the rate of change, how many volumes we tried to create and delete. But how this impacted our workload, in order to estimate that, we had to get a bit creative. We wanted to measure a delay of the persistent volumes provisioning and we did that by subtracting the volume creation timestamp from the volume attachment timestamp. And what we saw is that the, both the delay and the number of the delayed volumes was trending up and to the right with the pods that were pending following the same trend. And our workload was approaching breakage of some of the SLOs. But at the same time, the control plane was also impacted negatively. 
Kublet was trying to reconcile all these pending objects, and some of them it couldn't, creating a steady stream of API retries and filling up the controller queues. But Kublet and the control plane are not the villains here. Like if, if you really think about this, at this time, our scalability is limited by that external storage system that's not even part of the cluster. Something had to be done about this, obviously, so as you might know, the best solution to a problem is not to have the problem in the first place. And that's what we did. We got rid of the container storage interface and the external storage and all that stuff. <laughs> Made it all simple, right? Keep it simple principles and the persistent volumes replaced them with empty door volumes on the node file system. And it worked for a while. We onboarded some additional jobs and so on at the time, but then we found a new problem. Suddenly we were seeing that in the cluster there was a number of terminating pods that were just hanging around like for days for no good reason, it seems like. And inherently or intuitively you would think that when something like that happens, it's your control plane state that is not being updated by Kublet, which seemed to be true. Like the duration of the, the work you duration for the job controller was at its peak, but keep, keep the mental note of this graph because that 10 second number at the top or 9.84 is pretty important. We'll get back to this. At the, uh, but for the moment, uh, we didn't really know if this was the source or the consequence. Because the other side of the equation was Kublet itself. In Kublet logs, we found this error that we dubbed error 32, which basically told us that Kublet was failing to unmount some simple projected volume for a Kubernetes API access token. But what's worse is that this error repeated itself for hours, sometimes for days, which seemed to match what we were seeing with terminating pods. So could this be the problem? But it turns out those terminating pods are actually just a canary in a coal mine. The real problem was that we were back to square one in terms of the effect on the control plane. Once again, Kublet was trying to reconcile the objects that it couldn't reconcile because of that error 32. And given how frequently the error happened across the fleet, which was in the thousands per hour, arguably the effect in the control plane was even worse than before. And in times like this, you might be tempted to just blame Kublet, right? It's the centerpiece and that seems to be the, the villain. And we did, kinda, because it started to look like Kublet bug. Like what else could it be? Is it that or the storage is so overloaded or some, some issue exists there that the simple projected volume and mount operation for some reason would fail. Between hunting for Kublet bugs and ruling out the storage, we chose the simple pass and we decided to investigate the storage first. And we were glad that we did because in the cluster, a lot of nodes were actually spiking at 100% on node time spent, on time spent doing IO, which matched the behavior of error 32, which also happened only on some of the nodes. So we thought to ourselves that maybe resolving the source of this excessive IO would lead us to the resolution of error 32 itself. But that proved to be a little trickier than we anticipated. When we looked at the workload from the pod's, pod's perspective, and we summarized everything that was reported by the pods in a given node in terms of IO, that didn't match the node, what was reported by the node itself. We were like a couple thousand IOPs short that were just somewhere hiding. It turns out that the kernel writeback process was responsible for those missing IO operations. In turn, the fluent bit pod, the daemon set that was running on all these nodes, was aggressively buffering logs in the memory mapped files. But the IO that was generated from those memory, from the write back from those memory mapped files wasn't attributed to the pod itself. It was attributed to the root C group of the node, which is why we couldn't see it. But then changing the single setting in fluent bit reduced the time spent doing IO about in half across the fleet. Being aware now that the local storage could impact our scalability, we decided to implement some additional fixes and improvements and we knew that storage wasn't the problem. But the error persisted. In fact, the situation was looking even worse in the control plane. We knew that 84,000 items in the work queue depths for the job is bad, but how bad is it? Like, could we quantify the impact on the actual workload? When stuff like this, when you see in the queues this large, what it typically means is that the, whatever objects that controllers are reconciling, that reconciliation is delayed. In this case, it's a job controller, so we decided to measure the delay, and we subtracted the job creation timestamp from the creation timestamp of the driver pod, 
that was spawned by that job. And this is the callback to that graph. You remember that was saying, that telling us that, hey, your reconciliation takes 10 seconds only? Well, it turns out that across all those like multiple thousands of uh, jobs that we created in the cluster every second, the delay could be as high as two minutes. And for us, this was a big deal because 10 seconds we didn't care, but two minutes could really affect our SLOs, which were, uh, which were tied to data processing latency. And so we had to abandon everything else and really zone into finding, really finding the source of error 32, but we were also coming short on ideas. Like it was happening only in some nodes. We didn't find any bugs, any reports about a kubelet issue that was widespread. So we thought to ourselves, well, it must be happening under some conditions, right? And so if we find what those conditions are, we could potentially find the source of error 32 itself. But then we got a bit lucky. And it turns out that just like in the good old days of Web 2.0 when everything was a DNS problem, in Kubernetes, everything's a daemon set problem. <laughs> so the left side of, the left part of the slide looks familiar to you. It's our good old friend Kublet flooding the control plane with error 32 and reconciliation. But the right side is what actually caused all this. It turns out the error 32 was caused by a combination of the daemon set agent and a kernel bug. The daemon set agent used FA notify kernel API to monitor file system event changes. The FA notify itself in the kernel had a bug that sometimes held the monitored files open. And together those two things prevented Kublet from deleting those projected volume directories and thus resulted in error 32. As it's frequently the case in this situation, the fix is super simple, it's one line config change that resolved all these errors. The error 32 went away and the delay dropped like 10 seconds at peak from two minutes, which was great. But just to reiterate, all this time, our scalability was not limited by the control plane itself, right? It was limited by the data plane components that are not even part of our workload, strictly speaking, right? That actually, how the way they used the control plane. It took us six months to find all this stuff, to track down all these errors, to resolve the bottlenecks, and to finally start onboarding jobs again. It took a ton of uh, gentle Marine Corps style encouragement from my friend Shane and a team of smart engineers, particularly these fellas who uh, entertained my crazy ideas and uh, supported rollout of sketchy production changes. <laughs> We're not gonna talk about that. <laughs> With Kubernetes scalability out of the way, it was finally time for our 50% cluster reduction trick, which involved the Kube scheduler, but why, how? Well. The default scheduler uses the least allocated strategy, which requires bin packing at runtime in order to maximize the compute utilization, which leads to the interruptions to the workload. For the Spark jobs, we wanted to minimize the interruptions and yet still maximize the compute utilization, which is exactly what the, max, uh, the custom coop scheduler allowed us to do as it's performed the bin packing at schedule time. And the results were honestly even better than we expected. Just from this change alone, we were able to regularly scale down the compute and yielded us about 20% of savings. But there was one flaw in this near perfection. The rollout of custom coop scheduler had a negative side effect. And our, work, our workload was suddenly running in a single zone. Single zone not being designed to host the entire workload. Obviously, we ran out on a bunch of scalability restrictions once again. But it turns out Kubernetes was actually doing exactly what we told it to do. We set up the pod affinity rules between the drivers and the executors, hosting them in the same zone. But then after scheduling all those, all those pods, there was inevitably some capacity left. And the most allocated scheduler fit the next driver into that capacity in the same zone. The executors for that driver followed. And after a few cycles, the entire workload was just suddenly running in the same zone. This was perhaps surprising because inherently we expected Kubernetes or Kube Scheduler to have some sort of mechanism to prevent these events from happening, right? But it turns out the defaults, as far as the topology spread constraints, are merely suggestions, which works at large. It's just not a good idea for our workload. And so to restore order, we had to deploy uh, more strict pod topology spread constraints which uh, prevented the scheduling of the pods unless they could be satisfied and minimized the skew of the drivers between the zones and thus the entire workload. 
At this point in time, you might be wondering, like, dude, what are you talking about? Like, all this stuff, where's my magic trick? Where's the 50% cluster reduction? You're a charlatan, right? I couldn't possibly lie to you, but at the same time, I'm not telling you the whole truth either. You see, scaling Kubernetes is not about some magic tricks. It's true that over this period of time, we reduced the compute by about three times, while the number of jobs increased by about five times. But we didn't have to do anything to the control plane at all. No tunables, no concurrency increases, nothing. All this time, our scalability was limited by the way the data plane components use the control plane, or even like external systems to the cluster, the storage system, right? With their own scalability limits. But only once we resolved all those bottlenecks, we were able to deploy the optimizations to the workload itself, which finally yielded the dramatic reduction in size in the clusters. And that is the other part of the Kubernetes scalability story. Your workload might have such a dramatic effect on your cluster scalability that by the time you're done fixing it, you might have already reached your goals without even touching the control plane. Gang, were we betrayed by Kubernetes? Yes. Not really, but that would have made for a terrible opening. Gang, those numbers that I shared with you in the beginning are the Kubernetes scalability regression testing numbers that they use between versions. They're not real workloads. They were never intended as any type of scale guide, but that's okay. You don't need any of that anymore because we provided you with the same queries that we use every day around the world to find these villainous workloads that are robbing you of your control plane scalability. And once you have that under control, we provided you these guidebooks to help you understand the metrics and know how to set these control parameters inside of the control planes without guessing and safely. Gang, but if we wanna get on the DEMA level, not to let his head get too big, but if we wanna get on the DEMA level of this optimization stuff, we need to focus on the workloads. And I know that sounds like a, just fix the workloads, draw the rest of the owl problem, but don't worry. I provided you two guides that we use every single day right, that I wrote for you, that normally will do like maybe a third of the size of the clusters with these engagements. That's yours now. And don't worry, they're in the slides. And then if you're interested in going all the way down the rabbit hole on the optimization side on the workload, don't forget our misadventure series in Detroit. If you, we hope that we provided you with all the information that you need to find the scalability villain in your story. Gang, if you find this stuff helpful, do me a quick favor before you go. These uh, survey numbers are the difference. If I'm allowed to take two months out of my year to put all this stuff together for you, or if I'm helping you with your next laptop purchase at Best Buy, they're pretty important. <laughs> and a little bit of love goes a long way. Gang, it's, our, it's Dima and I's greatest hope that when you walk into work on Monday, you're gonna look those people in the eye and you're gonna tell them that all of this research is really your research. And you're gonna nerd flex on anyone that talks to you about Kubernetes scalability. Gang, thanks for making my dream come true. Have a wonderful rest of your conference. <laughs> <laughs>